Hi, this is Henk Ackermans, and this is Smart Asset Management Lecture 7, Degradation Models, Section 2, Failure Mechanisms. We already saw in uh, Section uh, um, 7.1 that uh, in the end, how assets degrade, uh, if we want to model that, then we have to take into account that degradation occurs because there's load and capacity, and the load uh, is... Uh, closer over the capacity and that creates degradation those loads in the end uh, what determines the degradation is the internal load but the internal load is caused by the external load now how the internal material loads translate themselves into degradation uh, for that there are different failure mechanisms and those failure mechanisms help us to look for well models formula um, uh, algorithms that, that when you put in the right input data, perhaps from those external system loads, then actually you can uh, make some useful predictions about the remaining useful life. Now, for all this, again, I borrow the uh, encyclopedical uh, knowledge uh, from, uh, from Tito Tinga uh, and, and his slides. Uh, and for instance, uh, this is the list of failure mechanisms that uh, Tito uh, discusses at length in his book. And we'll just look at the three bold ones over here, although later on we may look at, at corrosions. So failure mechanisms help us uh, formulate specific degradation models. The failure mechanisms are generic. Uh, so there are certain parameter values there. What is precisely the value of that parameter is determined by the specific setting in which you have the asset. But the general uh, physical rules, they, are, uh, they can be uh, found for a broad class of assets. So take static overload, perhaps the most common failure mechanism. It basically occurs when on some asset, piece of steel for instance, the stress applied to it is higher than the capacity. The load is higher than the capacity. The stress is higher than the strength. How high the capacity is, the static strength, is, is a material property. And in general, there are three stages if you gradually increase that stress. Um, uh, you can see that nicely on, uh, in, uh, in this graph. So this is a graph for uh, some kind of aluminium. And it shows the tensile curve. Which, and the tensile curve this, uh, shows that as you apply more stress to a certain, well, in this case, a piece of aluminium, to what, uh, what percentage of deformation then occurs. And typically there are three stages to this. There's the first stage, which is uh, elastic deformation in terminology, where you see that uh, the higher the degree of stress, almost linearly, proportionally, the higher the measure of deformation, at least in percentage. Uh, and then comes a stage around here where that becomes almost plastic, which is a term that denotes that for very modest increases in stress, there's a large deformation that can in the end, of course, only lead to fracture. What is specific, by the way, about aluminium uh, is that there is not a re and aluminium is a very common material in, for instance, aircraft uh, because it's light. Uh, is uh, there's not a clear point, not a clear tensile strength point at which this uh, transition from elastic to plastic occurs. So what they typically do then is, uh, let's say, if in 0.2% deformation, what is then the strength? Okay, that stress is then the maximum stress. You should not apply more stress there. Sometimes such a rule is not enough. Um, uh, if you uh, take fatigue, fatigue is a situation where even if you stay under that tensile strength uh, level where there's really a deformation, so it's seemingly stress, safe stress levels, there is still over time uh, a deformation which then leads to failure. And that is because the uh, stress is applied in a cyclical manner. There are cyclical loads and how, um, well, you should you typically think about something like in 10 thousands or tens of millions of, of stress cycles. So that's a long time. But of course, if you take a rotor blade and the bearings, etc., they, 
they 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 make lots of rotations so uh, that, that that may sound less than it seems uh, in terms of uh, uh, time required and there's also of course how much stress is applied the average the mean stress but of course also the of course but also the amplitude from low to high stress because that's a lot of a variation there so that's what happens with fatigue um, and uh, how long then uh, will uh, um, will uh, it take until uh, a, a, a material uh, fails uh, as a result of fatigue? Well, that, that of course uh, depends on the material. Uh, here is a, a so-called Wöhler curve of SN diagram where uh, you can see the relation between the number of cycles to failure, which is clearly an exponential scale that goes from the thousands to the, uh, to, to the billions, and the stress amplitude. And there you can see that for some materials like, uh, well, like steel, uh, there, if you stay under that endurance limit, then, then as a result of fatigue, uh, steel will not fail. Aluminium has not such a clear endurance uh, limit, so there, there's definitely there you have again take a certain percentage uh, of of deformation that you find acceptable, and you shouldn't be using that longer. Now these kind of uh, curves, uh, of course, for 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 specific materials, have been established experimentally uh, in the past, and they're usually available in handbooks to give you a certain guidance on, on, on how to formulate your specific degradation model. So that's fatigue. Another failure mechanism is wear. Wear is a very general term for very general uh, phenomenon. All failure mechanisms that are uh, associated with one part moving against uh, another part and creating some kind of friction there. And of course, the greater the force and the greater a certain friction coefficient, uh, the greater the load. It can also be, by the way, that some kind of medium is flowing along one part. Uh, so we basically have two types. We have the single body wear mechanism where there is a flowing medium. And we have the two body uh, wear mechanism where there are two parts involved. The result of this is that, and you can see that in the picture, is that material will be removed. And as a result of that, well, the fitting may be less good. As a result of that, vibrations may occur or cracks may uh, develop and fractures can even develop. What kind of wear mechanism? Well, we already said that two body wear and single body wear. If you look at two body wear, then actually there is strong bonding between these peaks of the surface roughness that creates friction, that creates temperature. There is a lot you can do there with good lubrication. With good lubrication, there is no direct contact between the two uh, surfaces and you can do something about the high temperature. But still, that, that's two body wear. Uh, there are different types of two body wear again and the, the distinction goes on and on between more and more different types. So uh, abrasive wear is, well, here's a, a grain of salt. That, that's often enough. Uh, when there's a considerable difference in hardness between uh, the two materials, and the hard material also have a rust surface, then the, 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 there is scratching and this removal of the softer material. If that is happening in a context in a corrosive environment where there's humid, humidity and oxygen, etc., then this goes quicker because then everywhere exposes some unprotected material that can corrode the materials. That uh, the, the, so the reaction product from that, they, they etch themselves on the material, but they're removed again through, uh, through subsequent wear. And so you can have pretty high wear rates in, in, in that context of corrosive wear, which is really a combination of corrosion and wear. You can also have, even if there is no direct contact between uh, the two surfaces, such as for instance with a bearing, then because just of the rolling, uh, because of the repetitive uh, transmission of the stress on the other material, you can still have failure. And that's called surface wear uh, failure. And finally, there's adhesive wear when the two materials have the similar hardness, but well, they get sticky, you know, they get that safe. And so some debris is transferred from one to the other surface. So many different kinds of two body wear in single body wear, the most common thing to think of is erosion. 
uh, erosion is usually uh, used in a geological sense, but and I suppose any case where some fl fluid or a gas is flowing along a part surface, you can uh, this can happen. If the gas contains little sand particles, for instance, then you get a combination of erosion and uh, and abrasive wear. Many different varieties exist there, but over time, if a fluid uh, keeps or a gas keeps keeps flowing along some material. Um, somewhere will occur. So that's where. Now, uh, what kind of degradation model, what specific parameter values you can, uh, you should use uh, given certain input, what is the expected remaining useful life? Well, you have to determine much more specifically a very generic formula that you can use to keep in the back of your mind is, well, an important determinant, of course, how much volume of material is lost here because that creates bad fittings, creates vibrations, etc. How much the greater the volume. So that's an important and volume we measure in this case by, uh, well, uh, cubic millimeters. Uh, that's proportional to the load. Makes sense, doesn't it? The load applied to it, um, the, the normal load that leads in, in Newton. And of course, the longer the distance traveled, uh, the greater that loss. And then physicists apply that by some parameter k, which solves all the other problems. And k in this case then is, is something very specific and that you will have to assess, but it's always proportional to the load and to the distance travel. But then you have to look, okay, what kind of combination materials do I have here? Is there a big difference in, in hardness? How rough is the surface? Uh, what's the temperature at the contact level, how hard is the material, how well or not well at all is it lubricated, that then will determine K again. And so you can arrive at, a, uh, at an equation that predicts remaining a useful life for a specific uh, wear setting. Now there are, uh, as I said, many other failure mechanisms. All of them are discussed in far greater detail then I'm uh, doing here now. We just quickly looked at static overload, fatigue and wear, and we'll have a closer look at corrosion, or more specifically corrosion and isolation in section 7.4. But at least it gives you some idea of the, uh, well, the physical underpinnings of those failure models. Also, when you basically look at data correlation, then it helps to think of the underlying uh, physical laws that should govern this, this type of degradation.